Hello and welcome to Car Pervert. I'm Johnny Smith. This is the infamous 1968 Dodge Charger that I've owned for almost exactly this month, 10 years. I've had the car on the road for nine of those years. I imported the car myself from San Diego and it arrived about 36 hours before my wedding day. So it actually was our wedding car, even though it didn't run and it had to be taken there on a trailer. So it was like a static ornament. The fact that it was supplied new to San Francisco in 68, I love, because obviously that was when Bullet was filmed and, and released into the cinema. Uh, so whoever bought this car was driving around San Francisco in 68 when the Bullet film was on the cinema. And I actually, uh, I did a home video um, on my honeymoon uh, where we did end up going to San Francisco and I did a tour, bought a book, and did a tour of all the places that were key points in the car chase of Bullet. It's a horrible old piece of video footage. Maybe I'll dig it out. Uh, yeah, I'll dig it out. It could be quite embarrassing. In fact, I might show you some of it here. Welcome to San Francisco. We're on 1025 Columbus Avenue outside Bidlow's 365 nightclub. And the Dodge Charger, the bad does up his lap belt just before they light the tires up on the charger and they're tearing off. But the Queen can't chase them because his car's going across. Smoke comes off the tyres, it's just beautiful. As you can see, it's a convertible, it's not a fastback. Although Ford actually gave Solar Production, Steve McQueen's company, which produced the whole film, they gave them the Mustangs for the filming. They didn't give them the, the Dodges. Dodge didn't give them the Chargers, they bought two Chargers. Identical black RT4, both of which sadly have been destroyed. But it's lovely to be here some 40 years later. One street away from here is where a very interesting part of the legendary bullet car chase happened, but I can't even begin to describe to you how steep it is. It's just unbelievable. And the views are stunning. Even, even when they're screaming kids, it's beautiful. But this car means a lot to me, and I know quite a few people have admired it um, and asked for more details, so I'm going to give you a walk around of it today. I was looking for one for over a year, uh, wanted a 68. Um, the 68 is different to the 69. 69 has like a big nose, chrome nose that divides the open grille. At the back, it has horizontal bar lights, not these quad circular kind of jet tail lights. And I per personally think that this is the best looking charger, but at the same time, I really like the 66s and the 67s as well. And I was gonna buy one of those. This is a 383 cubic inch car, which equates to about 6.2 litres. Um, this is the smallest of the big block engines. So there's the 383, used to be 330 horsepower when it was new. Uh, it was always a four barrel car. It's got a, an Edelbrock vacuum secondary four barrel on it and an Edelbrock inlet. I've actually got a Holly double pumper to put on it and an, an Edelbrock 383 Performer manifold, so I might put those on. Actually, Johnny, gonna have to stop you there, as since this video's been done, I have fitted that Holly carburetor, the new inlet manifold, and also a superior starter battery. But I'll show you all of those things in another Dodge-related episode. Yes, you've been warned, there will be more Dodge episodes. The more common ones, the 440, and then of course the 426 Hemi. Apparently the 426 Hemi is a pig to drive on the street because it's a slightly detuned race engine, whereas the 446 pack was, was the best. Massive torque, really reliable, stayed in tune. If it wasn't numbers matching, I would have probably put a 440 in it. We rebuilt the original engine, the colour it should be, to the spec it should be. The only thing I've really done is put an aluminium radiator on for modern traffic. We've put an electronic ignition conversion on it because I do that to all classics that I own because I can't stand points in the condenser, the rubbish. I've had it rewired, although it looks scraggy there. Worry ye not. I need to make a little panel to fit that onto, but all those connectors are new. They're actually German. They're as close to the original as I could get, but charger wiring is notoriously bad for, for corrosion and consequently, um, trying to set the car on fire. And the problem is when you pop the bonnet, if it rains, the rain runs straight off back down the bonnet and down into the wiring, which is really not a good idea. It's got an electric choke at the moment, but the vacuum secondary is a bit stuttery with a manual transmission. I've heard that is the case. So I might put the double pumper on this year. I've been promising that for three years now. You might have seen my previous MOT video of this car when it had the um, standard exhaust on it. Now it's got the Wartec exhaust, the switchable active exhaust. 
So stock exhaust headers, but then straight into this bespoke WarTech UK built 316 stainless exhaust with these beautiful active exhaust silencers. It's not straightforward cutout valves. These are hard anodized aluminium mounted inside and the silencers are a straight through design. There's no chambers to reduce the sound. They are beautiful. Now, that's louder. And even on standard exhaust manifolds, it sounds gorgeous and you've got that switchability so it can be a little bit more sensible if you want it to be. I bought this car purely because I wanted something that was quite weathered and well preserved and solid. You can see the original paint of the car was actually this colour green there are places where the green shows through and under the bonnet. It was painted at some point, I believe in the 70s, uh, this bronzy brown, which again, I quite like, but I like the fact that it had worn through, the paint hadn't been keyed up properly underneath and it was a cheap repaint. The car's actually been repainted from about there back. What Tim at Roadhouse Retro cleverly did is we scanned the original paint, the green, and we had some mixed up. We scanned this weird bronzy brown and had some mixed up. So he gunned on the green, then he gunned on the, the bronzy brown in the same way that the uh, previous, previous owner did. And this is the result of that. But we also kept a lot of the dents and the chips so that we could try and bring those back through with some flatting here and there. Because we wanted it to match from here forwards, which is where all the nice kind of natural wear and tear has happened. And I like all that. The car came to me with this bonnet, which had had, uh, I guess, a load of paint mixed on it at some point. It had been used as a workbench, so it was hideous. So in the end, we decided to just satin black the bonnet. Again, leaving all the dents, all the war scars, got all of those still intact. This car had a piece of grill missing when I bought it, and I have actually found another piece of original grill, but I just uh, I don't think I'm going to put it in. I know, weird, but I just don't think I'm going to do it. I recently uh, added a gold tooth to it a real gold-plated uh, overrider bumper over, just one to make it look like it's a bit of a pub, pub fighter. It's got these little dinks and dents and it's, it's just characterful. So from about here backwards, it's been comprehensively reconstructed. Lower rear quarters, rear corners, rear valance, the uh, boot floor is all new and that is a Mopar rot spot, uh, like you wouldn't know, the whole of the boot floor was gone. And down here, like I say, the, um, the rear valance is new. This, we, we tried to salvage the original rear tail light panel as they call it, but we couldn't, sadly. The front of the car, almost untouched. The floors of the car, almost untouched. I believe in San Francisco, it had been uh, kept in a carport uh, with the back poking out, which would explain why the rain would perhaps run down here and then fester. Because this car was a, a vinyl roof car originally. We zinc primed the roof before putting that on because there was no prep on the original roofs. It rotted all the way along here. They rot terribly down here. I still haven't found that piece of trim. This panel's new. The, par uh, the parcel shelf panel's been repaired. Moving around, it's had new windscreen. Uh, the doors are original. In terms of floor pan welding, it's had a piece about the size of my fist uh, on the from memory passenger side back floor. So it's a pillarless coupe. Uh, remember the Charger was one of the many cars that the Chrysler Corporation built that was um, monocoque, so no separate body and chassis. So it's quite modern for its time. It's got something called a cross-member subframe that bolts up underneath the car with all of the, the stuff on. So quite a revolutionary build for its time. As well as restoring a lot of the bodywork, when Tim uh, put the engine back in, which was repair, uh, rebuilt by a really cool guy called Ricky White over in the middle of the fens, who's really good at engine builds, ever so good. Um, the cars had Hemi, uh, leaf springs at the back, it's had KYB shocks all round, it's got new torsion bars at the front, uh, the brakes are all non-servo drums, it's got no power steering, this car had very few options, it was a bare bones car and it was possibly um, street raced a bit in its time. There's a, bell, a crack in the bell housing where we think it had been launched quite hard a number of times. Who knows, it could have been bought to have been raced, I got no evidence to support that, in fact it came with no history. Although I did keep in touch with the guy I bought it off, who's called Ozzy, 
and lives in San Diego. And he um, was really pleased that the car was not only uh, being looked after, but just driving around a Victorian uh, town in, in the UK with some black California plates uh, made up on it. And talking of the plates, this is the UK registration of the car. I have it on these California uh, replica plates for show purposes. Um, but to be honest, I drive this car in the grand scheme of things so little. Most of the time, if a policeman sees me, they just want to take a picture of it or sit in it. That's fine by me. Talking of sitting, let's have a sit inside. We've got a buddy seat in the middle here. So it's two bucket seats, this particular car, with a buddy seat. This is where you put your kids or you used it as an armrest. And my car came with headrests and very little else. It came with a radio that doesn't work at the moment, the TikTok tack, which is the clock and tachometer combined, which mine doesn't work anymore. And I've put the Mallory uh, taco on there, uh, but no center console. So the four speed sticks out in this little bulge in the floor pan. This is an original four speed big block, three pedal car. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I loved it. Whenever I get in it and get it out of hibernation like this, it smells of sort of hot oil and uh, wax and vinyl. A lot of black vinyl going on in here. Uh, these cars weren't that well made anyway. You know, they weren't made to live for 50 years and it's weird. This year I've had it 10 years. This is, a, the Charger celebrates its 50th birthday. 1968, of course that means the film bullet, the iconic film with that car chasing it is 50 years old this year all the sense of people, sensible people, they, they know that the baddies uh, Black 68 440 Charger RT was a superior vehicle to a 390 GT Mustang, no offence to Mustang owners, but I would much rather own a 68 Charger than a 68 Mustang Fastback, although they are both gorgeous menacing, nasty in their own way. Personally, for me, I just think the 68 Charger is the ultimate shape muscle car. It's got this amazing Coke bottle rear. It's got this line which comes down here and then fades away into these door, these fake door vents, which I love. And then this other crease starts up here. This front wing, it's hard to show you on the footage. When you look down on it, it bows out this way but it's concave down here. It's a really beautiful shape. I love the fact it's got no eyes. I think it looks super, super menacing. Yeah, I love that about it. The headlamp doors open up by vacuum, compressed air and suction. Um, these actually do still work, believe it or not. There's an actuator switch, the headlight switch. When you switch it on, you hear a sucking sound and it sucks them open with these bellows. Those are the running lights underneath and they're the indicators as well. These holes in the bonnet are where they're called um, hood turn signals. They should be indicators. They were an optional extra. Um, you can buy delete option plates that insert into there and I might get some of those. Or you can buy the aftermarket indicator kit. It was quite neat. So when you're looking down the bonnet, you can see if your indicators are on or not. Oh, actually, Johnny, you did buy some. You bought some in 2019 and you need to fit them. So go and fit them. Didn't want to go for fancy wheels. I've actually gone for a wheel called a Wheel Vintique Steely. They're wider than normal, but they're the same sort of Dodge Steely pattern. I'm getting covered in pollen. I thought I'd do it in an arty field of yellow oilseed rape, which is nice and tranquil against the aggressive foreground of the 68 Charger. But yeah, I went for these wheels from Wheel Vintiques. They're steels, they're based upon the, the design of the originals, but they've been banded. They're certainly wider at the back. I am going to put some red line tires on it because I really want some authentic red bands. I think they'd look really good. There's quite a lot of classics out there that actually aren't that enjoyable to drive. They're great to look at uh, and, and you just enjoy listening to them perhaps. This is a car that surprisingly it drives so well. It's so rewarding to drive. I'm so pleased I got it. I can sit this in traffic on the M25 and have and it's fine. It's not as hard to drive as it might seem. Get a lot of kudos from other people because you think it's going to be a right handful it's actually it's not that much of a handful and it doesn't even weigh that much by today's standards uh, 330 horsepower back in the day well yeah it's the torque that surprises you it'll just pull and pull and pull and pull but yeah 
it's just a case of driving it really now and just doing those little tweaks here and when it's an old car as and when it needs a few maintenance bits and bobs needs a few add-ons a few little trinkets cars are there to be driven even if they're valuable this car has no doubt gone up in value in the last decade that i've owned it, uh, it but i don't care because it's not for sale and i honestly i hope that i can always afford to keep it it's been really really reliable and it's a very rewarding car to put miles on to be honest Just one of the most enjoyable cars I've ever owned. To drive, to enjoy, because you don't have to worry about the paint, 